One of the most famous medical symbols is the snake, a serpent, a snake on a stick. It's almost universal, all different countries, sometimes hospitals, sometimes medical offices, institutions, they use the snake as a symbol. And it's the Greeks, the, the Greeks used to uh, use, used to held that, that they prayed to the, to the snake, they used it, at, they believed that it was the god of healing. And uh, definitely in culture, the snake and healing really go together. The, probably the earliest source for this is in this week's Torah portion, where we learn how Hashem tell, told Moshe to take the snake to heal the Jewish, to heal the people, to heal the Jewish nation, the people that were, that were bitten by snakes, as we shall soon see the story. And here, obviously, the obvious question is, how did the snake, how does the snake have such a dual personality? On the one hand, snakes in the Torah, also, especially in the Torah, represent a very almost an evil creature. They, 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 they're, they, 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 they're, they're, they're poisonous. The first time we meet a snake, a serpent in the Torah is in a very negative story, a very negative light, a very negative light. And how did that all of a sudden turn, turn into the symbol of healing? How do these two almost uh, personalities in the snake, um, two ideas that the snake represent fit together. It almost seems like an oxymoron how we have the snake on the one hand as the symbol of evil. In Kabbalah, the, like, the worst term that could be used is the snake, the, 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 fir the, the first snake that shows on evil, shows on what the, the, the what is called in Kabbalistic literature, the other side, the side that's the opposite from spirituality, from godliness. And here all of a sudden it turns into this positive force and this positive symbol. So how, does, how do these two things go together? Um, so background. This week's Torah portion, the Torah portion of Chukat, which means the statue of the laws, Continues the dis the description of what the Jewish nation the the occurrences, what happened with the Jewish nation, in the desert. Now, while the while the last week's Torah portion was really in the first two years, at the end of the second year of the desert, this week Torah por this week's Torah portion jumps thirty eight years forward and is speaking about what happened by the end right before the Jews entered Israel after the 40 years of wandering was up and really until the end of the Torah it's going to be the Torah is going to be describing what happened in the end of the 38 years so after the big uh, stories that we had in last week's Torah portion the story of the spies and the story of the The story of the spies and the stories of the of the Korach's rebellion. So now we're back to nothing. I guess nothing uh, noteworthy happened afterwards. Those are the big stories, and life continued as usual until this week's Torah portion, where we were all the way by the end. At, we discuss Miriam's passing and how the after Miriam passed away, the water stopped their source of water, which was a well that traveled with them, a portable water fountain at its source that was a rock that gave water stopped after Miriam passed away. And that's when we have the famous story of Moshe hitting the rock, and uh, which eventually caused that that was the reason why Moshe was not allowed into Israel. And then the Torah discusses Aaron's pa passings, passings. Moshe's uh, brother, that he passed away, and when he passed away, the Jews in the desert were protected by clouds of glory. There were these clouds that traveled around them, which 
essentially protected them and, and was, was like an uh, iron dome, a fence, an invisible fence. It wasn't so invisible as a cloud, but it was, a, it was, so to speak, like a fence that fenced them and protected them from any creatures that would harm them and from any uh, people that would want to harm them. But after Aaron passed away, he, the clouds of glory left. The rabbis teach us that there were three essential aspects that the Jews really lived off in the desert. There was the, the, the man, the manana, that, that they, the food that they ate every day. There was the well, the water that they drank. And then the clouds of glory, which, which were protecting clouds, protected them, it shaded them from the sun, it flattened out the, hill, the hills to make it easier to travel in the desert. And it also killed and got rid of the snakes and scorpions and any dangerous creatures or unwanted creatures and uh, obstacles on the way. Now, these three essential aspects that gave them that really their, their life was dependent on them, pretty much food and shelter, they had in merit of, in the merit of three righteous people. The man, the food that they had was in the merit of Moshe. The water that they had was in the merit of Miriam. And the clouds of glory was in the merit of Aaron, the high priest, Moshe's brother. And therefore we find that after Miriam passed away, the water stopped. And after Aaron passed away, the clouds of glory stopped. And they returned in the merit of Moshe. Right? So originally these three, the clouds of glory and the water was in the merit of individual righteous people, the merit of Miriam. Moshe's sister, and in the merit of Aaron. But when they passed away, it stopped. And then Moshe, and in the merit of Moshe, they returned to the Jewish nation. So that's why we find that after Miriam passed away, there was the story of the water, the Jews, and there was no water, and the Jews complained. And then after Aaron passed away, the clouds of glory stopped protecting them. Now the Torah relates that after. Aaron passed away and the clouds of glory stopped protecting them. So now trouble came. In for trouble. The, the Amalek, the nation of Amalek, which already tried to attack the Jewish nation in the past, came again to attack the Jewish nation. Their protection left. The clouds of glory that essentially protected them from the um, other nations seas. So they opened an uh, open opportunity to fight against the Jews. And they fought against the Jews. They lost the war, but already the Jews were not so excited about what's happening, they, that they had this war. And they started to get scared, like this is even before we enter the land of Israel and people are attacking us. What about when we get closer? And we're, we're still, at the end of the 40 years, we're, we're, we're scheduled to ent enter the land of Israel very soon. So let's forget about this whole thing. We're not interested in, in, this, um, in this running, in this, in, this, in this fighting, in these wars, in these obstacles. Let's just go back to Egypt. And actually, the Jews went back. They started to travel back. And there was a war. The Levites said, no, don't travel back. This is a bad idea. Our forefathers, our, the last generation, 40 years ago, they tried this idea. They tried to travel back. And the, the spies, the story of the spies, they didn't, want Israel, they didn't want to enter the land of Israel. And they were stuck in the desert for another 40 years. Let's stop. And there was a civil war. Yeah, go back, not go back. Then there's the Levites won. But a lot of Jews fell on that day. Now, this is all the backdrop of the story that we're about to learn together and discuss today. Let's go to our source sheet. Did Rabbi Smith send the email out? Okay, anyone got an email?
I just looked a half hour ago. I didn't see anything. Didn't see. Um, let me see. Because I actually moved recently and my internet is not set up. So I didn't, well, it seems like you didn't see my message. Um, no, I don't see it. Is there any way you can send it out to us? I'll, I'll try to send it. Let's see if we could. Uh, it didn't come in. I'm using, so I'm using my phone now. So while it is working, but. Um, see if we can figure out how to send. You want me to call Rabbi Smith and ask him to send it out? Yeah, that'd be a good idea, Susan. Okay, so yeah, okay, that would be. And just tell him I WhatsApp that to him. And then I guess. Rabbi, you, you uh, you're in a new position now. It, it's yeah, not as, I... it's not as comfortable to me to hear you and to see you. Can you go okay. back to the old way? Another well, place. Yeah. The problem is I'm using my phone. Here, let oh, me... I see. Is it better now? Yeah, all right. Well, is, is, is you, next week you'll be back to the old way? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Is, is it easier this way? Yeah. This position is better? Yeah. Okay, so we'll keep it like this. Yeah, we could it's... see you and hear you well. It's not right. a problem. You're fine, Rabbi. All right. Okay. Let's. Uh, okay. So we'll. Yes, sir. Read the story. I'll start reading it. And Rabbi, then, um, Rabbi Smith is going to try to send it right now. Okay. So when the email comes, everyone could uh, catch up. Right. So the Torah says the following They journeyed from Mount Har by way of the Red Sea to circle the land of Edom. So really, they really traveled this, but because of the war that we described, the civil war, that some people want to go back to Egypt, some people did, and didn't want to enter Israel, and the Levites were saying, no, we have to enter, it's not a good idea, it didn't work out last time so, so well for us to, uh, not to enter. So because of that, and they started to go back, so the, so the, the people, they started to get annoyed at the whole thing, such a schlep. They went back seven, seven stops, were not where we were holding before. And they started, what happens when people get tired? They start to fetch and complain. So that's exactly what happened. And the people became disheartened because of the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Right? So they didn't, you, sometimes they complained against Moses, sometimes against God. Here they which was also something that was wrong, that they complained about against both of them together, as if they were equal, which they obviously are not. They said, why have you brought us out? Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this desert? For there's no bread and no water, and we are disgusted with the light, the, this light, literally rotten bread. The people said, they started to complain. What are we eating? We're eating this this mun. This mun is this rotten bread. Now, why are they calling this? Why are they calling the manana rotten bread? Wasn't it heavenly bread? Didn't we? Um, it was able to be tasted like anything they wanted. So, Rashi explains that what they're complaining is that since the manana was a heavenly bread quite literally, it fell from heaven. So it didn't have any waste. Everything that was there was perfectly, um, uh, um, uh, was perfectly evaluated for what the human body needs. And there was no extra. The nutrition, everything was, was exact. So then they were saying, we have this bread that is not consumed and therefore they never needed to let it out because it was, it was 100%, it was 100 consumed by their bodies. So they said, if this bread is consumed totally by, by our, by, we, to, we consumed it totally, we're going to explode one day, right? So this is rotten bread. It's not bread that is normal bread. We want regular normal bread that we knew about 40 years ago before we, this, this month started to fall. So they were speaking against the month, basically. 
they start to complain. Now, why over here? They were eating this month for 38 years. Why are they complaining now that this is light bread, bread that doesn't have normal nutritional values and therefore it stays in our bodies? Why are they complaining now, uh, 30 years late? So there's an interesting explanation. The Or HaChayim, HaChayim Benatar, he says the following idea. He, sa- he explains that when people travel, especially they, when they walk long distances, they want to eat something that would keep them full for a long time. So many, so people would eat something that takes longer to digest. So they were saying, we now need to travel into Israel. We need regular food. This light food is not going to do it for us. So that's why they're complaining now. Now, obviously, this was a complaint. This wasn't an accurate uh, complaint. The reason why they, they, the, the reason why there's no waste from the man was because there was a heavenly bread, a godly bread that had no waste. That was perfect. That was exactly what the what the body, what the human body needed. But they were looking for what to complain, and they found what to complain about. Right? Whenever someone is looking to complain, they have what to complain about. Rabbi, he sent the email. It's in oh. our inbox now. Okay. So back to the source sheet number two. So what happened next? What happened next, the Lord sent against the people the venomous snakes. And they bit the people, and many people of Israel died. As a result, or as a response to the, to the Jews' complaints, Hashem sent a snake, the, the venomous snakes, poisonous snakes, to bite them. Right away, what happens when something goes wrong? The people came to Moses and said, we have sinned and we, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he removes the snake from us. Right? They complained. They got punished. And right away, they went to Moses, save us. Beseech the Lord for us and inter- intervene for us to, to, to remove this deadly Punishment. So Moses prayed on behalf of the people. The rabbis point out, idea the rabbis spoke about, how the Moses prayed on behalf of the people. Sometimes we find people forgive. But for Moshe, even though they spoke against him, like they said, they spoke against God and Moses. Why did you take us out of Israel? You're, nevertheless, Moshe forgave them in such a whole heart, wholeheartedly, that he prayed for them. Not only forgave them, he prayed for them as if nothing has happened, which is uh, something very unique. So Moses prayed on behalf of the people, and the Lord told, said to Moses, make yourself a serpent and put it on a pole. And let whoever is bitten look at it and live. Take the snake and put it on a stick. Raise it high up. And anyone who was bitten by it, let them look at it and there be healed. Moses made a copper snake and put it on a pole. And whenever a snake bit a man, he would gaze upon the copper snake and live. All right, so that's the story that is told in this week's Torah Torah portion. Hashem, Hashem, the Jews complained. And Hashem said, you don't want my miraculous bread? I'll show you what a life without miracles is like. You're in a desert. Desert is poison. The snakes r- rolling around freely. They'll, they'll attack you. They're, they're, they would, uh, they're, going to, they're going to bite you. And that's exactly what happened. Now, the obvious question here is, what exactly is the identity of a snake? How did a snake turn into the angel of healing? As far as we're concerned, the snake represents evil. The snake is the one that brought the the first sins and the first punishment into the world. We know in the beginning of the Torah, it discusses how 
the snake tricked Chava, Adam's wife, Eve, into eating from the fruit of knowledge. And she fed Adam. And therefore Hashem chased them out of uh, paradise, out of Gan Eden. And the snake really represented... The snake started that whole situation of sin and punishment. And it said that without that sin, man will live forever. So he really brought death upon, upon the world. And in that story, the snake really doesn't come out in good light. Now the snake did something wrong. It tricked Kava, tricked Eve into doing, into, uh, into sinning. It represents crookedness. And so how did all of a sudden they change this identity to be this angel of healing? Another very interesting idea about the snake to show how far the snake represents the evil that there is in the world. The Darizal, after Darizal passed away, the Darizal is one of the famous Kabbalists lived in Svas a number of hundred years ago in Israel, and he studied Kabbalah, he taught Kabbalah. And one of his students, after the Rizal passed away, said, sometimes there's someone that is so righteous that passes away, that the only reason why we could, the only explanation we have why they passed away, they didn't sin. They're pure. So why did they pass away? Because of that first sin, because of the snake. The snake affected the whole world and mixed evil everywhere. And therefore, everyone passes away at some point because of the snake. So, in other words, you have a person that you don't know why he passed away. Blame it on that snake, on that first snake, which, uh, which, which, uh, which, which brought death and curse upon the world. So that's how far the snake goes in, 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 um, in representing evil and uh, the opposite of the only. And here it turns into the angel that, that uh, gives life, the angel that gives healing, that heals. So this question is obviously not a new question, like most good questions. And we'll start off with a Mishnah, how the Mishnah explains this idea. A number Number three, number three in the source. The verse states, make for yourself a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it should come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he sees it, he shall live. Once again, it may be asked, did the serpent kill or did the serpent preserve life? Meaning, is it up to the serpent to kill or to preserve life? Um, wait a second. Okay. Right. Wait, um, man. Does everyone see me now? Yeah. We see yeah, you, okay, plus good. we see the screen, the Zoom. Sorry. I just uh, lost myself. Sorry. All right. Um, so uh, once again, it may be asked, did the serpent kill? Did the serpent preserve life? It's not of the serpent. It's in the hands of Hashem. So the Mishnah says, rather, when the Jewish people turned their eyes upwards and subjected their hearts to their Father in heaven, they were healed. But if not, they rotted from their snake bites. So what the Mishnah is saying, 100%, it's not up to the snake to give life or to give death. But rather, it is... Or rather, it is dependent on the on Hashem. And the point is, the point of putting the snake on the on the pole high up is that people should look up 
look towards the sky, and through that, it should remind them about Hashem. The Ramban Nachmanides, or Moshe ben Nachman, he explains an interesting idea behind this. He explains this mission in the following way. He says, there's a certain idea, maybe it's more psychological, or maybe it's a uh, that um, that when someone is bitten or hurt by something, it should you shouldn't mention to them the idea that caused the pain, that caused the source of the of the sickness, because that might that might make it worse for them. So here, by showing the snake and having everyone look at the snake, that sort of shows that this healing is not a natural healing. It's not natural healing because if it was natural healing, you shouldn't use a snake. You shouldn't, the snake shouldn't be the, the, the reminder of, uh, of, of uh, the snake shouldn't be the reminder for, for the sort for, uh, for, to look at heaven. But in any case, the question is still very strong. Why a snake? You want people to look at heaven. You want people to think about Hashem. Uh, maybe put a chumash on top of the on top of the stick. Maybe put some other holy object on the stick. Hang up a sign. Write something. Why the snake? It still seems, and especially that when by putting the snake there, it actually gives room for a mistake. Like we mentioned in the beginning of the class, that there were some religions that actually believed that the snake is the source of healing. The snake is the, the snake is the source of, 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 of the God of healing. And therefore they prayed to it and they served it. And this mistake wasn't only between other nations. In the Jewish nation, there's also a prevalent mistake that people served the, the snake. And that's why it actually says. About um, Chis- about Chizkia, I believe that he should that he removed and destroyed the snake. That people were of Moshe, Moshe, he destroyed it, he crumbled it because he didn't want because people were serving it, and even though it's a holy snake, Moses built it and uh, designed it. But since people were using it for the wrong purposes, he felt that he felt that it was a need. It was necessary to to destroy it, and he actually did destroy it. And he's praised for it. The prophet praised him for it in Kings Kings two chapter eighteen because it brought it, it made him it made people it misled people. But if it can mislead people, why should the snake be used? Why are we using specifically a snake to for healing? It seems totally counterproductive to use a snake, which first of all is the messenger of, of death in many cases related to the evil nation, to evil. And it was in our story, the source of their, of their dying, of, of, of their harm. And here we're using it as a snake, as a, to put, place it on the stick. And through that, hoping and to, to bring healing that people should that people should look at heaven and rem- remember that Hashem. And our questions are, first of all, how are these two things go together? The fact that the snake is, a, is the symbol of evil, and on the other hand, it is used for healing. And second of all, it seems like the snake is very connected with the healing. It's not just happens to be the two things together, but it's connected, and therefore... That is the specific way that Hashem decided to heal. And the question is, why? Um, anyone have any thoughts about this? Yeah. I believe that maybe it has to do with um, snake being uh, an animal that changes the skin quite often and became new. That's kind of a, a very specific way of of healing becomes new. Second one, 
maybe not in old times, but now we know that the venom can be actually a healing play, you know, could be something that is used as a medication as well. But right. I think the most important is that the skin that they actually change. The, the snake, snake change. I don't know how often, maybe some other people have more ideas what, how often the snake is changing the skin. But I think that that's, that's one of the kind of symbolical right. things. Right. So very, very interesting thought that changing the skin represents renewal yeah. and being refreshed and healing. That's a, I never heard that one. That's a, definitely original and nice idea. Um, any other thoughts? I think, I think the common way of thinking of a snake is from, uh, from the four Adam and Eve. Right. And, and there, and there it, it plays a very negative role. Right. So, and here it's playing a very positive role. No, but the snake that bites you is not the positive one. Right. Moses makes a positive one. Oh, so you're saying we're able to, Moshe was transforming the negative snake, the venom and snake, into the source of healing. Right. By, you, by making you look up towards God to see the, the snake that Moses made, that, that's what you Through that, we could transform the source of... Um, of pain into healing, right? Yeah. So uh, I guess we'll, we'll go on that path soon. It's definitely a, a very nice thought. Um, yeah, Susan, you put your hand up. Yeah, you said the word transformation, transformational. Yeah. Don't, don't bite the hand that feeds, feeds you. And yet we have to have, we have to have it this way. We have to have being bitten and we also have to get the same medicine from the same being and we right. always have and the reason for us looking up we must always look up and that's why they use the snake but that's why moses put the snake on the stick out of fear and also he knew god knew they're all going to look up because the snake is is something to fear and also right. something you know that's to get their attention Right, interesting. It very well be. Any other thoughts? Okay. So we'll start with an idea that Rashi says. We'll learn it inside. Number four. And actually, Rashi really ex explains why they were. Why, the, why, why was there punishment for snakes? Why snakes? So Rashi says the following, number four. Slander come exact punishment. And they bit the people. Slander. Let the snake to whom all things. Right. And they bit the people. The snakes. So Hashem said the following. Let the snake who was punished for its slander come and exact punishment from these people who slandered me. The Jews spoke against Moshe and Hashem, like we saw in source number one. So therefore, Hashem is saying, who was the first one who spoke against Hashem and who tricked and lied and really sinned with their mouth? The snake, the snake of, by Adam and Eve, way back in the beginning of creation. So, isn't it a perfect punishment? Snakes, for, isn't the snakes attacking them the perfect punishment for them? And then, the, then, the, then Rashi continues. There's another aspect here. Let the snake, to whom all things taste the same, come and exact punishment from these people who eat one thing, and that tastes like anything they wish. The man was the almost the dream food. Imagine you could have one plate and whatever you want it to taste like, you could taste like. You're in the mood for steak this, this tonight for supper, it'll be steak. You're in the mood of, of having a vegetable supper, it tastes like vegetables. Whatever you want it to taste like, it taste, tastes like. So he's, Hashem said, look, that snake which is eating the, the, the earth and everything tastes the same to it, 
and it's 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 eating the 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 things that are on the floor, the garbage, the earth. So let it exact punishment from people who are the opposite. They're able to eat something and it can taste like anything they want. So really, what Hashem is saying is that. The, the snake really represented their sin. And the Jews could have said, what's the big deal? He, we spoke against Moshe. We said, we said some things against Moshe. We're tired. We're stressed out from the journey. Stretch, sh- stressed out from the occurrences of the clouds of glory left. And the Malik fought against us. So we spoke against, we spoke against Hashem, we spoke against Moses. What's the big deal? It's only words. They didn't rebel. They didn't, they didn't rebel against Hashem saying, we don't want to go to Israel. They didn't make a golden cat. A few words. So Hashem said, you know something? There's someone else that also only used a few words and destroyed the whole world. The snake. A few words convinced Chava, convinced Eve what to do. To, to sin, which which created this domino effect, which affected and harmed everyone for generations to come. So what Hashem was saying is, Hashem was sending a message with sending the snakes. Don't be like the snake. You sin like the snake, and yes, the words have a lot of power. And that's the first snake that that only said a few words, created this domino, this, the, the created and brought so much evil to the world. So yes, your few words also are harmful. And therefore you should be careful about what you say. So that might explain why Hashem specifically wanted to use a snake to, to, to show on healing, because the snake really was here to explain to them what went wrong. What they did wrong. And was really here to explain to them, don't follow the path of the snake. So while this explanation explains perhaps why a snake is the most befitting punishment and maybe source of healing to remind them what they did wrong, but at the end of the day, it sounds like from the from the Torah that the snake is also is actually what brings the healing, actually linked and connected with the healing. How could that be? How could the snake, the source of the evil, the source of the of the of the punishment of the of the harm be connect? How could that be connected with the healing? Now, here we get to a very deep idea, an idea that was that is explained by the Chabad rabbi, rabbi, rabbis from the first one, which is Zalman of Liadi. And the rabbi really expanded upon this idea and quoted this idea and, uh, and used it in many times, speaking about the Shemitah portion and, and other stories. And the, the following idea is really going to teach us how we should view or how we should try to view when something happens that we don't really want, when something unwanted or bad happens to us, and how perhaps we could how perhaps we could we could address it and and overcome the obstacles that come our way. If we think about how the Jews were at that time, at the time when the snakes came and attacked them, they were probably on this, they're probably in a very low spirit, here, they're a nation about to enter Israel, and there is this devastating plague against them. The snakes, the, the poisonous snakes and serpents are coming and attacking them, and people are dying left and right. 
they probably felt beaten. The spirits were probably very low. And they probably felt like they want to give up. They wanted to surrender. This is just not working as planned, not, not working as the, the way we want. And here Hashem comes and says, I have a message for you. The snakes, don't look at the snakes the way they are down here. Look at the snake the way they are on top of a stick. Don't look at the, the way they are up there in heaven, the way it is in its source. While down here, a snake is venomous, poisonous, represents anything that's not godliness, the satan, the evil inclination. But its source, the, its angel that takes care of all the snakes, knows that they're only, it's a, it's a servant of Hashem, it's a message from Hashem. Hashem says, when we go through trouble and hard trouble, as hard as it must be, as it might be, sometimes we feel uh, this is like that trouble and obstacles are, are the biggest challenge. It challenges our belief in Hashem sometimes. It, sometimes it could be such pain that is, almost, that is almost impossible to bear. And many times we surrender. Where's Hashem? He's closing his eyes. What's happening here? So here Hashem is saying, is sending a message. Hashem is saying, yes, it is hard. We want it to be good. But let's use these obstacles to grow further. Let's use these obstacles as a stepping stool to reach higher. And for that, the only way we can really do that is if we understand that these obstacles and challenges, even though the way we perceive it and the way it affects us, it's very negative. But in its source, it's really, it's really positive. Which sounds ironic. How could these two things go together? There is a, a saying in the Talmud that the satan, which is the, the, the example of evil, and Penina, Penina was the, was the aunt of, of the prophet Shmuel, and, his, and Shmuel's mother, Hannah, didn't have children for many years, and Penina used to have many children, and she used to tease, sorry, one sister, she used to tease, they were both married to the same husband, she used to tease Hannah that, you know, why don't you have children? You're doing something wrong. Maybe you're not doing, uh, you're not acting the way you're supposed to act. And really what she, so really what she was doing was something very wrong. So the, the, the rabbi is saying, the Talmud, that the Sultan of Tmina both had in mind for heaven. What does that mean? They both have in mind for heaven. So what it means is, even though they both do something that is very, they, they're both doing something wrong, but they, their intention is something good. The Sultan, the, the source of evil, even though it's the way we perceive it is bad, but the reason why it's there is that we should overcome it. The reason why it's there is to make us stronger. So sometimes we can have something that is wrong, that the way it affects us is very negative, but it's source. The reason why it's there is that we should overcome it and grow from it. And while obviously this is a very hard thing to understand, but really we see it like was mentioned before, that one of the ways to cure from snake bites and actually from many diseases is by using 
the the disease and you know and taking the sometimes using the the source of disease to create the antibodies like that like we're hearing a lot after covid to uh, to uh, to protect us the doc, some people that are able to fight against disease create um uh, create the the, necess- the the necessary uh Whatever it is to uh, fight the disease, and through that, through the through a little bit of the of the disease, we become stronger. So if we get a lot of it, we get sick. But if we get a little bit, like every vaccination, if we're taking a little bit that, that we're able to overcome, so then it can make us stronger. So it's true about snake bites. It's true about diseases. So here we have that a the source of the sickness itself is also the cure. Which means that when we go through troubles and when we go through hard hardships, there could be a few, there could be different approaches. One approach is to be is to be becoming broken, is to, that it breaks us, to give up. Another approach is to try to ignore it, which usually is very hard, doesn't really work very well. But then there's a third approach to be inspired by it to try to become stronger through the obstacle and that is through understanding and through trying to translate and to explain to ourselves that yes it's very hard and this is a hardship and a challenge but in the end of the day this also has a reason and the reason is for me to become stronger so first we have to understand that it has a reason, that it's here for a reason. And while this doesn't in any way explain why it happens, but it could help us how we relate to it, how we deal with it. And that's really what Hashem, Hashem was doing by putting the snake on the, on the pole. He was saying the way it is down here, snakes are evil. Snakes are dangerous. Snakes are harmful. But the way it is in its source, there's a reason for it. So you have this obstacle, you have something, you have an obstacle. Think about why did Hashem give us this obstacle? So true, we're never going to really know the full reason. And it's never good to explain why him and not him, why her and not her, why it's this person, not that person. And it's not going to answer all the questions. But it could give us the tools to try to strengthen ourselves and try to grow from it. And that's really the source why Hashem gives us, gives us challenges, that we should grow from the challenges. And here, there's a beautiful idea that the Rebbe once related. This coming Monday is the day that the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson, was freed from jail. In 1927, he lived in, in, um, in communist Russia. And then in communist Russia, the former Soviet Union, really, they, 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 they were fighting against religion, fighting against teaching religion, learning religion, religious behaviors, religious studies. And the uh, previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, he lived, he was the leader of the Chabad movement in that time. And he didn't bend the communists, um, the, 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 the government had a special unit called the Yevsekzia that, that was there to fight against religion, to shut down, to... to to chase after any track of religion and to get rid of it. And at a certain point, while realizing that the previous Lama was really the, the obst- one of their main obstacles, being that he inspired and he pushed people to, to really to, to spread religion under, no matter how much, under any cost and any, any circumstance, and to make religious learning Torah available for, the, for anyone that wanted. And he, he created this whole secret network 
of rabbis that went around that strengthened Judaism. So, but re realizing that, they put they arrested him, and they actually had a death sentence for him. And in a miraculous way, there was a lot of international pressure, and there was a lot of, and there was a, a put on them, and a lot of prayers for the for the previous voucher. But in a miraculous way, he was freed on the 12th of Tammuz, 1927, which was the day, which was, which is next Monday. Yeah, comes out next Monday this year. So the previous Bach Rebbe also wrote a diary describing um, a little bit of what he went through. It was very into writing, prolific writer. He has many diaries. So he also has a diary of his time in prison. And there's, uh, there's this, all this amazing entry there. He writes that he's describing the, the life in prison. And he says, there's no time. There's no dates. There's no time. The only way you could tell the time is by figuring out based on the activities that are being done. When they wake you up, when they give you breakfast, a little bit of bread, a little bit of warm water. Um, uh, when they give you rice or porridge. And then when they put you to sleep, so you could assume they wake you up in the, early in the morning, they put you to sleep late at night, they're giving you the bread in the morning, breakfast, giving you porridge in the evening. So there's no time, you're not able to tell the time, there's no clock. But you could tell by what's, by the order of the prison, what's happening, what time it is. And then he writes, and this is what it says in the Medrash, that Moshe, when he was by Mount Sinai, there's no night or day in heaven. Everything is spiritual. So how did he know when was night, when was day? He was able to tell from the from the from the heavenly angels that when certain angels praised Hashem, he knew it was day, and when other angels praised Hashem, he knew it was night. So here, in order, in other words, in order to break the spirit of the prisoners, they didn't give the prisoners even the freedom of knowing what time it is, of having any independence. They were led, the prisoners were led. The jails then were terrible, still terrible. All jails were terrible. And then they're even worse. And here, in one, in one idea, in one sentence, the previous about Jerebbe writes how he, what, they didn't tell the time, right? To break the spirits of the prisoners. And he says, he connects it to this madras that explains that how the most of the time from things that happened. And the Lubavitch Rebbe once, in, in um, 69, 1969, he was, he, was, he was on a public address. And this week, when he, he was speaking about this week's Torah portion. And he said, how did he do this? How did the previous Lubavitch Rebbe write in one in one sentence, the description of his jail and connecting it with, the, with heaven, with the way Moshe was in heaven. Aren't these the most furthest things apart that you can think of? A communist prison and Moshe in heaven trying to accept the Torah? It's, it's mind-boggling how he connected these two things. So the Rebbe explained, no, this is exactly the idea that we're saying here. The idea is that how do you view the snake? In our case, the prison. The way it's here, it's a terrible thing. He was, he was spreading Judaism, and now there's the greatest obstacle. He was stopped. He was practically stopped. He was put in prison. He, his, his initiatives were, were put on hold. And he was tortured in many ways. He went through a terrible few weeks. He was there for three weeks that he was there. But nevertheless, the way the previous Bajra viewed the prison, he didn't view it the way it is down here, the way it's a snake. He viewed the snake the way the snake is on the stick, is on the pole. He realized that here, there's a reason why he's here. And the reason is that it's to strengthen him, that it should make him stronger. And when he viewed the prison in this way, that gave him the power and the courage to overcome it and to leave stronger than he got in. 
And that also gives him the ability that he's able to connect it to, to, uh, to that is able to connect it to these, the prison with the way Moses was in, in heaven. And this is the idea that we're, the general idea that we're trying to uh, develop here, that the idea of putting the snake on the pole is to tell us and to teach us the proper way to look at snakes, the proper way to look at obstacles, that when we, we see these obstacles, we should try to understand that they're here for us to grow and to strengthen us. Is the snake the way it's down here, the way it's a venomous snake, the way it's a poison snake, but then there's the snake the way it's the source of healing. And we have to understand that that is the real identity of the snake. And it's the way it's down here, it's just disguised. It's disguised, it looks like it is evil, and it is evil. But there is, there's the idea of, of uh, overcoming it, and through that, coming, leaving stronger than we entered stronger than before we accounted the any given obstacle. Just to summarize, we discussed the famous story of the snakes that bit the, the nation, and through that, they, they, I, 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 they bit the nation and killed many people, and when they cried to Moshe to pray to Hashem, Hashem said, take a snake and put it on the pole to, to and they should look at it and cure it. And the obvious question is, what's, what in the world is happening here? The snake doesn't have the power to cure, and it doesn't have the power to kill on its own right either. It's both a come from Hashem. So why is the snake, what is the snake doing on the pole? And we essentially brought three ideas. One idea is that looking at the sky, to look up, upwards. But we said, and praying to Hashem. So we said, well, that explains in general the idea of looking upwards, it doesn't really explain why the snake has to be there. Then we said another idea, that the snake is the, really represents what they did wrong. The, the, snakes, the snake represents the, the, the sins that are connected with speech, the, the sins that are connected with slander and speaking against people or against Hashem. So that's why Hashem said it put a snake there. But that also falls short, it falls short from explaining how does the snake turn into the source of healing. And here we came to the idea that the Rebbe develops and speaks about that the snake, there's the way the snake, the way we perceive the snake, the way the snake is in our world, and the way the snake is in its source. And sometimes, some, sometimes things that are very negative, the way we perceive it and the way, it's, the way it affects us really have a positive source. And this teaches us that we have to remember that when we have an obstacle, we shouldn't, we shouldn't give up. And we shouldn't even try to ignore it. But rather, we should try to be inspired. We should try to strengthen ourselves, ourselves through it and try to understand and re-translate it and, to, and, to, uh, and through that to be able to to become, come out of the obstacle stronger than before we encountered it. Um, any uh, questions or comments? Yeah, I'm um, uh, done. I wanted, I wanted to ask, wasn't the reason the rabbi was, uh, the rabbi was uh, jailed that he sent money to Turkey, to the Ottoman right. Empire? So that's that's the first voucher. That's our Mishnah Zalman of Liyadi. Oh, the Liyadi. But the previous voucher of it was 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 um like the Soviets used to call counter revolutionary activities, which is basically yeah. anything they don't want. And in this case, it was spreading uh, Judaism. Okay. Um, it is interesting that in most pedagogy classes that I attended. The best advice to a child is before you really explain how they're supposed to behave, they should say loudly what is exactly the problem, what exactly they need to be excused for. And without this admittance of the fault, 
the healing will not happen. I think that it's a very similar kind of idea here, that symbol that was on the stick that was demonstrated was a constant reminding of, on, of, on one hand, that yes, it, it was a scene that it was, you know, bad words can hurt more than uh, guns sometimes. That's why I believe that that's kind of a very interesting idea that was presented. The second one, it's funny that since we were children in Russia, we were told all the time that religion is a poison. Religion is a poison. It was the most common phrase that you will find in every study book in uh, elementary school, middle school, and high school. That's why it's so interesting how, you know, you could use the same symbol to inspire people to do good deeds. And you could use it as an example. I think it's really a good kind of comparison for you saying that snake has two part, two faces. It could be a poison and it could be an inspiration. I just thought it was kind of interesting. Interesting comparisons. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank, Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Everybody have a uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Rabbi. 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 Thank you, Rabbi.